All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Barnyards and Backyards Live. I think this is our fourth season, episode one. So uh, Jenny's pulled together a very creative lineup for us this season. Uh, some of our watchers who are with us today might have noticed that uh, Jeremiah is absent. Uh, he will be in future programs, but our my my host, my co-host today is Micah Most. He is the uh, extension educator in Johnson County. And um, our guests today are Brian Sebade and Abby Perry. But before we get to you guys, got to do a few ground rule stuff. So uh, hold on, bear with me. Um, for those of you who are new to the Zoom platform, uh, we've made some changes this year, if you're familiar with what we have been doing, but we'd like for you to ask your questions through the Q&A, uh, which is uh, if you take your mouse over the top of Zoom and uh, it will, there will be a, a menu at the bottom that comes up and there's a little Q&A button there. You can, if you have comments, if you'd like to ask questions, you can enter it through there. And if you're following us on Facebook, please enter your questions in the comment section with the uh, at the Facebook page, and we will pull your questions forward uh, to our guests, and we will get them answered. But um, I think that's all I needed to let you know. So our guests today, Brian Sebade and Abby Perry, they are extension educators in the uh, southeastern, south central part of the state. <laughs> are Abby, are you considered central? <laughs> I don't know we i mean i am central but you know <laughs> how we split it up in extension southeast corner yeah okay you you have a big county that covers quite a range and our topic today is uh making syrup out of box elder and uh so i am really happy to have you guys here i know there are a lot of people interested in doing this and so i think abby you're up first right would you like to take the program over uh, I think that Brian's going to give us a little introduction first, oh. and then, yes, I will. I'm I sorry will for over. being confused then. No, that's okay. Me, <laughs> We're easy to confuse you, Jeff. Uh, I don't, we don't speak easy. clearly, not yeah. to talk about your intelligence. We just don't speak clearly. So, um, so Jeff, I wanted to um, see who's getting sick of winter so far. Um, I know Abby and Rollins, you've had a lot of snow. I know Casper, Lander, there's been a lot of snow. Um, so I'm just curious who all has, you know, had enough of winter and you're kind of wanting to start thinking about some, some warmer days, some longer days, all those sorts of things. So um, I don't know if you want to just think to yourselves or somehow just, uh, you know, raise your hands by yourself, but I'm guessing that most of you have probably thought about that. So uh, one thing for me that gets me thinking about spring is when it becomes that time to actually start tapping trees uh, to try and collect some sap. So we're going to go into some of those details here in a little bit um, and uh, talk about when that's going to happen and those sorts of things. But, uh, you know, really we're looking at, you know, in 11 days or so probably is when we start, you know, this process for some parts of the state. So. So for some of us, we're probably going to be getting close to that uh, that time when this happens and uh, getting close to spring. So um, the other thing Abby and I wanted to quickly talk about is, um, you know, we're talking about some stuff that we've done in the past, um, but we're also doing some things in the future. Um, so Abby and I are a part of a, a grant that's a multi-state grant with Utah State um, and Idaho State looking at um, tapping box elder trees um, and other types of maple trees in uh, Utah and Idaho to kind of see a feasibility study of sorts for how this really works um, in different areas across the West. So, you know, Abby and I, we're going to be tapping trees in natural areas, um, but we'll also be looking at park systems. Um, for me, I've done stuff that's in natural areas, but also in parks or urban areas. Um, and so the project we're working on is going to be doing this um, as well. Um, and so, you know, you may end up seeing some information out there where Abby and I will be hosting some workshops over the next couple of years, uh, hopefully doing a little bit of hands-on type of stuff um, with some of those, but some of the other ones uh, will be similar to what we're doing today. So if you have friends or family that missed out, would like to uh, 
sit in on something, we'll be hosting those uh, kind of in the Southeast area here of Wyoming. So that's kind of my quick plug. I'll be okay. quiet now, Jeff, and uh, we'll turn it over to Abby to get things started. So <laughs> thanks, Brian. Go ahead, Abby. All right, thanks. Um, so the Manitoba maple or the box elder maple is one of a few different varieties or a few different species that we have here in Wyoming. We also have a Rocky Mountain maple, um, a big tooth, the Norway maple that can be tapped for syrup, but it's kind of few and far between. Um, I think I know of one that's in Rollins, so it's not a great source for lot, lots of syrup production. We just don't have very many. Um, there's a hot wings maple, but it doesn't really get big enough to tap. And then we don't really have any. Wait, I'm really disappointed to hear that the hot wings maple is not big enough to tap. Oh you're, yeah. You're telling me it's not gonna get any bigger than it already is? I've, I've only got I've only got one in my landscape and uh, this is not it but uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's uh, it, it's a very beautiful tree and I think a lot of people have been planting them yes I think of them as I call them little patio trees they're great for okay. like the front yard and kind of small stature don't like crowd over your house but yeah not not great for not, the not size tapping. for tapping okay all right. Um, and then we don't have any sugar maples. So really that kind of just leaves us with the box elder. Um, it is most prevalent on the eastern side of Wyoming. That's not to say that it's not in other places, but that's just kind of the native range. And it's more common to the riparian areas. So areas that there's water, streams, creeks, that sort of thing. Um, some people consider the box elder to be kind of a trash tree or a weed like tree, not very desirable. Um, there's actually a Wyoming a Game and Fish publication called the Wyoming Wildscape, and it talks about the box elder tree as being great um, nesting habitat for birds. I think that the sap actually attracts insects, and then those birds come in and eat the insects. So it does have some, you know, like habitat uh, quality. Um, I think when we talk about box elders, though, a lot of people think about, oh, those darn box elder bugs. And, um, you know, the, they're not harmful, they're not dangerous, but they can be a nuisance. And so that's another reason that people might consider the tree to be um, undesirable. So this is just a distribution map of the native range of box elders. Again, if um, you know where you live isn't in that pink range, that doesn't necessarily mean that box elders aren't there, just again, more prevalent in that eastern side of the state. And then um, this is kind of the counties that we find box elders in. And so the counties that are missing from this list are the counties on the west side of the state. Um, again, just, just where they're kind of more prevalent. This might be a premature question, but uh, since we are apparently having more moisture this year than we have in previous years, do you think production might be higher than average? Brian or Abby, do you have a feel for that? Or is that a question that I need to hold until later on? Um, I think that's a good question, Jeff. It's kind of hard to know. I think that's one of those things of we really need to understand that. Um, I think for the areas that have lots of, um, you know, precipitation, they're probably fine. Um, most years, whether it's wet or dry, right, if they're right next to a stream system and there's perennial water all the time, they're probably okay. But some of those areas where it's maybe not, you know, water all the, all the time there, um, we may have a better year. But um, it's really hard for us to know for sure, I think, here in Wyoming, how that interaction really happens. Okay. So sorry. this, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. So this is um, an image of just kind of what it looks like in um, like a natural habitat to find box elders, the Manitoba maple. Um, they're going to be occurring with other species. So you can see probably some cottonwoods here, maybe others. And so just important to kind of touch on um, identifying the tree species before we go into winter and there's, you know, less identifying um, characteristics or things that we can, yeah, notice like the leaves. Um, this is the female Manitoba. And 
it has the seed pods and then it also has that lovely box elder bug. So the male does not have the seeds and it does not have the female. So both male and female trees can be tapped for syrup production, but only the female is going to have that obnoxious little bug. So if you're wanting to plant box elders at your uh, location, then trying to find a male is um, the best bet to kind of avoid that nuisance. Um, so how this works, we want to target the xylem part of the tree. So this is where we're transporting water and nutrients. It's how we get the sap. If you tap into the phloem, really like nothing happens. You're not going to get any sap. If you go as deep as the heartwood, you might still get sap, but could also damage the tree. So here's kind of the side view with the tap hole from um, the drill bit and then putting the spile in, which is actually what gets or allows us to get the sap out of the tree. So in this image, you can see that it it says like one and a half to two inches. And I think that Brian's gonna hold up um, a drill bit. So what you can do is just um, kind of put tape around that drill bit. And then um, that gives you a little bit of control as far as, or not control, but tells you how deep you're actually going into the tree. So you can make sure that you get to that xylem portion of the tree to get the sap. Brian, uh, you might have to make a comment. I don't know if, uh when we're speaking if the if the program actually shows the person highlighting so you might want to just make a comment about the drill bit to make sure that you're seen okay so here hopefully i'm being seen um so yeah you can just use any drill bit that you want hopefully it's not super dull but i just put some masking tape um so this is about an inch and three quarters um just because i know i'm probably going to go a little bit past when i actually drill in so um that just helps me understand where I'm at um, so I can actually drill in a little bit. So what diameter is the drill bit itself? So it depends on what yeah, I was ask that too. It depends on what tap you get. Um, so um, this one, for example, is 7 16 because that's the size of tap I was using. But you need to just match the, the bit to whatever size tap you get. So tap, spout, spile. Uh, Lots of different names, but that's what we want to go with. So the tap diameter is not consistent across manufacturers or styles? No, it's not. So okay. we'll get a little bit more into the taps and uh, how those are not consistent at all either. So. Okay. All right. So as far as getting started, um, want to make sure that you're selecting healthy trees and trees that have at least an eight inch diameter at chest height. You want to find several trees to tap. Um, I think at the end of this presentation, we'll talk about a little bit of like the field research that we've done. Brian was tapping some trees for production in northeastern Wyoming and tapped 10 trees. Four of those trees really didn't do much at all. And six trees, you know, had good production. So you want to make sure that you're tapping enough trees that you can be successful. Usually like, you know, 10 to 30 trees is somewhat manageable. Um, the timing of all of this, we want to make sure that nothing's greened up yet, the ground is still frozen, there's probably still some snow on the ground. Um, where you are in Wyoming, that's probably a little bit different of a time period as thinking about the fr frozen ground and green up very different, you know, different locations. But kind of rule of thumb is thinking about February 14th, which I think Brian said at the beginning of the show, 11 days away, we can start thinking about this process and going in and um, getting trees tapped and then just kind of checking back regularly to see if things have started to flow yet. What is the schedule? I mean, how frequently do you go back and check them? Um, we talked about this a little, like it can depend. So um, you might get a lot of flow for two or three days and then not have anything for like six days and then it might start flowing again. But that's kind of on a tree by tree basis. You know that you're kind of done because all of them have stopped mm. flowing. Um, but as far as you can find a lot of variability within like the singular tree. Does that make sense? I don't know that's if you have true. anything to add, Brian. Yeah, I think 
I think the main thing to know is like, it's not going to be consistent, right? As soon as I tap on February 14th, I'm going to have consistent flow for four weeks, right? Um, some places it may be only two or three weeks. Others you may, some years I've had it go that four weeks, maybe even a little bit longer. So a lot of it really depends on what you have for weather. So I've tapped trees and they had some sap that was starting to flow. And then we got some really cold weather. Um, and we ended up, you know, I think it was like 25 below or something like that. Uh, this was a project I did with Sundance High School. And it's like, uh, okay, this isn't good. What's going to happen? But everything was fine. Um, and, uh, you know, it's one of those things I probably should have mentioned at the beginning is um, thinking of spring, like this is something that gets you out. So I remember talking to one of the high school students. I saw him at one of the local restaurants. And he's like, hey, are you that guy that came and talked to us about this? And I'm like, yeah, I'm that guy. And he's like, man, I didn't really enjoy my spring semester, but that was really fun because I went out every morning before school to go see what was in the bucket. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, and so they ended up going around, Jeff, you know, there was some trees right there at the high school, but they also went around to some people's yards, some front yards, some backyards, um, and it ended up putting in some, some taps there. So, um, I think what, you know, um, you know, Abby's talking about here, as far as, you know, this is kind of our, our natural setting that we have, you know, we have trees that are fairly consistent in their shape and size, uh, but you may have different, uh, shapes and sizes that are in backyards around towns different things like that um, obviously uh, we probably don't need to say but we will anyways you know make sure you're getting permission wherever you're doing this <laughs> um, a lot of our box elders <laughs> Manitoba maples they tend to be on private land um, so if you are doing it somewhere make sure you're getting permission with that um, and I think you know there was a comment about somebody that had a sugar maple and you know you may find a sugar maple that somebody's planted um, but you know, as far as finding some of the more natural ones uh, that we have occurring, that's our list. So uh, you may strike it rich and find uh, somebody has planted sugar maples in their backyard um, as just some trees. But uh, yeah, there's lots of variability. Um, so you may get, you know, lots of sap for a couple days, and then you get a big freeze and things shut down, and then you know it warms back up. But I think the main thing that I always try to talk about is once you really see the ground thaw out and you see green grass starting to sprout, uh, that's pretty much when you know it's over. So, okay. um, and then it just shuts off. Well, I guess uh, if you are asking people permission to tap their trees, the nice thing to be to do would be to uh, maybe give them a sample of what you produce at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so, that way they'll, they'll encourage you to come back, maybe. <laughs> right. So in that previous slide, there is the, like, like Brian was saying, kind of the native setting. You can see how far apart the trees are. Um, they're not very upright. They're, you know, they, are, can, they can have quite a bit of lean to them compared to what you find with sugar maples, still snow on the ground, no, no green up grass. But also these trees are along a stream bed, like we said, you know, is pretty um, common for where they naturally occur, which means that there could be an opportunity for wildlife interaction. And I think that that can mean a lot of different things, but you're getting that sap out of the trees and could attract maybe unwanted helpers. Um, and then in the next slide is kind of more of what you might expect in an urban setting. Um, so there's some box elders that are planted in rows. They are more upright because, you know, they're more groomed and kind of cared for. To me, the bark looks a little bit different. They're probably um, younger trees than what we saw in the previous picture as well. So Abby, we see here, like these have obviously been planted by somebody mm -hmm. in, this, in this place. Um, are these trees available commercially or like if folks are wondering where they could get their hands on some box elder trees like do they need to just go down and dig them out of a creek bed somewhere or what, no. what are your thoughts there? No, they. I mean, they're available commercially. I think that it's probably a little more challenging to get a male specifically than, you know, the female, like um, if you were trying to target one that didn't have the insects, but I think that they're commercially available. Do you have more to add to that Brian yeah come dig up all the seedlings in my front yard that I get to pick <laughs> up pulling out every year um if somebody has a tree close to you a female tree you're probably going to find lots of seedlings that are 
that are growing up. So you can take some of those if you want, Micah, but I think the main thing is thinking about, you're worried about bugs trying to find male only trees. So, um, but they're probably not going to be as commercially available as some other species, but um, you know, you're still able to find those. You know, if you wanted to plant some sugar maples, you could, um, but keep in mind that Wyoming is really dry, right? They like humid environments, lots of water. Um, so, you know, trying to make sure that you keep them really well watered. Some parts of the state, they might be just fine, but other parts, you're really going to have to take really good care of them to make sure that they're, they're doing well. So um, generally they're fairly cold hardy enough for where we're at, um, but, but that's one of those things you've got to think about. So yeah, good question. Thanks. So the I think next slide we have is just some things to be thinking about as far as different taps and containers. Um, you need taps and containers for collecting sap. Um, we have some pictures here in a minute of kind of like the Wyoming approach to tapping trees. So milk jugs work, ice cream buckets work, juice jugs work, really just anything that can kind of contain that sap. Um, there's some, you can do hoses. Again, we have some images of this, but hoses taking sap from the tap to the bucket or whatever container that you have. Um, a lot of this is readily available on the internet for purchasing, and there's different kind of bundles of things that you can get with hose and taps and filters, or just like a 25 pack of um, taps for $25 kind of a thing. Um, it is important to make sure that you kind of have some backup containers because they may uh, freeze while they're out there collecting sap and you won't be able to like pour the sap out of it into another container and then return that container. So you need to have, you know, other ones available to keep collecting. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Abby. So, um, so yeah, with Wyoming's fluctuation and weather, uh, things may, be, may might be great one day and then you hit that 25 below and it's like, how do I get this container off the tree, right? So Jeff, how are we doing on questions? Do we have anything that we need to answer that we're not keeping oh, we're up? We're doing with? pretty good. We have one good? that um, uh, we that came through Facebook, I think, or it might just be Jenny. And I forgot to introduce Jenny this time. <laughs> I apologize, Jenny. <laughs> so, um, is alkalinity a problem with sugar maples iron chlorosis in Wyoming? Um, probably. I haven't seen too many sugar maples, but um, I don't know what their tolerance is for high pH soils. Um, probably to some extent, if we think about where they grow natively, it's going to be more acidic type soils. So um, I'd have to look more into that. Um, Again, it's one of those I don't always necessarily recommend just because of the whole water issue in general. Um, you know, finding one of these native trees is going to be a little bit better suited for where we're at. They can handle sure. some of those higher alkaline soils um, and all those sorts of things. So, uh, but yeah, I would imagine probably to some extent. So, As with any other tree. As with any other tree, yes. Yeah. And so, Jenny, I do apologize for not introducing you, uh, everyone. Uh, Jenny Thompson is also uh, along with us uh, for this ride today, and uh, she is a specialist in southeastern Wyoming. She is working behind the scenes to make certain that everything is running as smoothly as it possibly can. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and I see we also have another question about how much we can expect for a tree. So I'll get to that in just a minute. I wonder if that's the same John Shea that takes care of my financials. <laughs> <laughs> Might be. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about the process. Then we'll get into some of that stuff about uh, what we need to do as far as thinking about collection, processing, all those sorts of things. So uh, the thing we want to talk about today is this is going into your backyard. This is a small property. This is what we're talking about today is not full on. Here's what you need to do for commercial grade types of stuff, right? This is not um, here what you need to set up for for a big commercial operation. <clears throat> That's not my expertise. Mine is more of this backyard type style things that you can do with things at home, all those sorts of things. So um <clears throat> there's lots of different um spouts taps different things that we can actually buy so so brian I like, 
Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, you might get to this. Do you prefer plastic or uh, metal taps? I prefer metal. What's, uh, why do you prefer metal? Well, you've seen me building high tunnels with you. <laughs> you think I'm good with plastic things that probably break? Get a bigger um, hammer. <laughs> yes, get a bigger hammer. So um, I prefer the metal just because they're a lot sturdier. Um, that, uh, you know, that's just personal preference. Um, plastic ones work just fine. There's not an issue with that at all. But I just kind of prefer the metal ones. Um, I prefer this one that's a little bit bigger. I've got a nice hook depending on what I'm using. Uh, we showed the picture of Jay, uh, or we'll show a picture of Jay um that's using um some other containers for collection um so the hoses are kind of nice okay so we talked about that natural setting and abby talked about some of those trees are kind of bent over hanging over um and so you know they these are kind of nice because we can hook up that tube and kind of put a container below it we don't have to worry about somehow weirdly hanging you know on a tree that's almost at a 45 degree angle in some some instances so those are kind of nice. Um, a lot of these, you can buy a, a custom bucket that goes with them. So if you've got really vertical trees, you can buy a bucket that goes with them. Uh, that works just fine. Um, but otherwise, I'll show you an example here in a minute of the, the tube. So here is like the cheapest way you can go, right? Like a 50 cent tap, an old milk jug, and some really cheap twine and just tie it to that tree. Um, and you're good to go. An old um, clean milk jug. What's that? An old clean milk jug. An old clean milk jug. Yeah, you don't want any of the chunks still hanging out in the yeah. bottom. Right? That's not good. You will boil it, but we don't want that. Okay. <laughs> um, and so, you know, this is a pretty cheap and simple way to go. What I like about this as compared to this, here's another cheap way to go, right? This one is fairly exposed. So later in the season, you may have things like flies that try to get in there. Uh, this one um, is a little bit more covered, right? So we don't have as many insects or other things trying to get in, a, in at that, you know, sugary stuff. Um, so to me, I kind of like that if you're going to go a cheap route. Um, you can also buy bags that hang off of these. Um, so basically, it's just kind of like a I don't know, plastic bag that holds hangs off the bottom. Um, those can be nice as well. The thing to keep in mind is wildlife, right? So that picture we showed before, you know, there's several hundred head of elk that winter in that pasture, um, depending on the year. And so setting up a tubing system could be really tough um, for them knocking it down. You've got to think about squirrels, raccoons, other things that might be out there that may just be curious, not necessarily wanting to get at the sap, but you know, you do have something that has some sugar in it uh, that things may be after. Uh, so here's picture of Jay. We've got a tap in a tree. This is one with the plastic tube. Um, so we've drilled in um, just like the other ones with that tube, we can actually just put into a milk jug or a different type of container. So Brian, we do have a question. Okay. Might, might be pertinent right now. Um, okay. Cheryl was asking how what is the range where you want to put your taps in? I know chest height is where you start, but can you go higher? Can you go lower? Yeah, so you can basically go wherever you want. Um, I guess I would recommend going wherever it's easiest for you. So okay. you're the one that's going to have to be checking these daily or every two days. And so, you know, I would really avoid going super high or super low. Um, Sometimes, you know, if you have them below, there's a chance for, you know, if you do have cattle that are in the area or elk or whatever it might be, something knocking it over. So um, I like to have them fairly secure and in a place that's easy to access. Okay. Um, you know, lots of times I'll try and find like a big main branch above where I'm going to tap. Um, just hopefully thinking that there's lots of activity happening within that tree at that spot. But as we all know, with some of these bigger trees, like this one next to Jay here, uh, we can end up with areas that, have, you know, this tree might be on the decline as far as health. So, you know, maybe there's just parts of that tree that just aren't real actively growing. So, you know, we're trying to catch things as they're moving up in the spring. Um, so sometimes we just might not hit a good spot. So, okay, yeah, great question. Uh, I, do, I do have another uh, question. Clay from Facebook would like to know what... 
what's the USDA zone that uh, box elders will grow in, or what's the lowest? Um, I think they'll actually do zone two. So okay. um, as you can see on that map, you know, they're clear up by zone uh, or up by Lake Winnipeg in Manitoba. Um, so if you've been to Manitoba or North Dakota, you know, during the winter, you know that like sometimes it makes Wyoming look like a paradise, right? So, yeah, right. Um, so yeah, you know, I've got, I'd have to look up, but they're for sure a zone three, uh, but they okay. handle some really cold temperatures, so. Hardy. Very hardy, yep. So that's what's cool. They're a tough tree. <clears throat> um, so I put up this guideline for number of taps per tree. So I put this up just to kind of think about, okay, this is from Penn State. So this is from Pennsylvania, right? The East Coast. So places where they get lots of water, um, probably have some fairly healthy trees. Um, but I think that this perhaps doesn't always apply to Wyoming, right? So I think when we think about box elder trees or Manitoba maples, and we're looking at what we have, um, sometimes when we get these really big trees, as we just talked about, perhaps they're on the decline as far as health. And so you'll tend to lose some of the production that you would anticipate, okay? So lots of times I may only recommend that if it is an older tree, you're probably just looking at one tap. So, um, you know, most of, from what I've done as far as tapping trees, I probably wouldn't go more than two um, into one tree, even if it is this really big size. Um, just because I feel like once you get over that really big um, size, lots of those trees are starting to decline. So um, I really would recommend over two. Um, and most of the time, if you're in an area, you have a decent amount of trees anyways, uh, one tap's usually going to be enough. So um, we're gonna talk about some numbers later uh, to kind of point out how if a tree's being productive, it's being productive. And if it's not, it's not, right? So adding more taps isn't going to encourage that tree to produce more more syrup or more sap that flows. So Brian, does, mm -hmm. does tapping these trees hurt them in any way? Does this like decrease their life expectancy overall? Yeah, so that's always a good question to ask. Um, so for the most part, no. Uh, most trees recover just fine. Um, and so when that happens, um, you just have to, you know, make sure that you are picking a different spot on that tree each year for where you tap that tree at. Um, make sure that it's a tree that's, you know, well taken care of. You know, if it's a tree that's in a backyard and, you know, you've got, you know, somebody's changing their oil on their truck right next to it and there's lots of compaction and lots of human activity of where it's maybe not a healthy tree, right? Yeah, it may, it may suffer from that, right? So it's a really dry year. Um, you know, we are taking, you know, water and nutrients from that tree um, out of the system. So uh, for the most part, we're probably okay, um, but it is something to keep an eye on. You know, if you do have a prized tree in your yard and you've just been, you know, tapping it every year with several taps, depending on the size, and it starts to look like it's not doing so well, um, might be something to back off on. But for the most part, they're usually okay. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, sure. with the two so as long as you're like, find, just find the balance between what you're taking and what you're giving, basically, then. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Um, so, you know, this would be something more indicative of a, um, you know, commercial operation. We have a lot of tubing. Um, this tubing all generally goes to one spot. Um, I was lucky enough to visit an FFA teacher uh, by Traverse City, Michigan one time, and he kind of took me through what he does. Um, it was summer, unfortunately, so I didn't get to go through the whole process, but he really kind of walked me through what he does for collection, what he does for an evaporator, um, what he does for filtering, how he gets things done. Um, and so, you know, for him, he has a system like this, he taps every spring, and then he has a big you know, like we see here in Wyoming, water containers, right, for when we don't have a well system or whatever, and he pumps it into that food grade container that's on a trailer, you know, it's like 200 some gallons, um, everything pumps to that, and then he's able to drive it to his evaporator that's in a barn by his house. Um, so lots of times you may see where somebody has a shack set up or a building, an outbuilding, where everything flows into that, 
and then it goes into the, the evaporator that way and takes care of things uh, for finishing the crop. But here in Wyoming, right? This is more of our style, right? Jeff and Mike and Abby, right? Whatever's uh, convenient, right? Whatever's convenient, yeah. right? So this is going to be more of our style. So, um, so yeah, we want to make sure that we're um, doing the uh, the filtering and you know storage, right? Um, you know the best that we can, even though we're not a commercial operation. So, um, some big things as far as sap collection goes. Um, Make sure that's in a food grade container, right? Um, don't use an old oil container or something, right? That probably goes without saying. Um, you need to make sure that it's boiled within a couple of days of collection. Um, you know, just because of logistics, we had some from our site um, at Savory when we did this, um, just because of the time lag, I'll show you a picture where we didn't get it boiled fast enough. Um, if you don't boil it fast enough, you will know, and it will not taste good. Um, it does can you, can spoil. You freeze it? Can you freeze it? To, Absolutely, to... you can freeze okay. it. Yep. But um, the problem is, if you have this much, how do you get it all frozen, right? So mm -hmm. towards the end of the year is where this becomes really challenging. Not so much an issue like in February, right? But when you get to the middle of March and we start getting some nicer days, um, this is where it becomes an issue. So. Um, so try and get it right away. Um, before we actually start to boil it, we're going to make sure that we actually filter it, okay? Um, it's been sitting outside. You may have insects that are in there, debris, other things like that. We wanna make sure that we're, we're doing that. So, um, so if we're kind of doing the backyard system, we're gonna put it in containers that we can store it in and move it if we need to. Um, and you know, obviously these are old, um, milk jugs or water bottle containers, um, things that we can put, you know, liquids in that are safe to drink. So we want to make sure that we're doing that. Okay. Um, so we have lots of coolers and different things for transportation. Um, if we needed to, we could somehow put ice on these if needed, but I just really want to stress, try not to be storing it. Try <laughs> to make sure that you're boiling as it comes in, because otherwise you will have some that goes, goes bad. Uh, how are we doing on questions? Do I need to answer anything? I think we're good. Jenny asked one. Um, does the uh, the teacher that you learned how to do this, uh, does he sell it? Did he sell his product? Yes. Yep. yep. Okay. So he had, uh, I guess, a commercial operation and then, you know, had stuff that he actually sold. I don't know that he so much had a storefront, but just would, would share with other people. Okay, and uh, did we get John Shade answered? I think so. That, that is John Shade. So uh, okay. maybe he can help me invest in maple syrup production somehow after this talk. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> All right. So, okay. So filtering. Um, this was the big thing I took away from that FFA teacher that has his commercial operation. So I always did this, but I think my product was not as clean as what I would like. And I think learning from him, that was a big thing. Um, and so um, the big thing is getting a nice filter. So this is a felt filter. Um, you know, I'm putting this up here to show you that there's various ways that you can get this done, right? Um, is it reusable? It's reusable, you can wash it out. Um, the main thing is when you start doing the finishing product, um, some of those, after you wash them enough times, I feel like they get kind of scuzzy and they should probably go to the beginning stages of when I'm actually getting a lot of the raw, nasty stuff out of here. So okay. so a really clean one or a brand new one should be used in the finished project. Product. Right. That's okay. what I prefer. Um, you can, like I say, you know, you can wash it out and clean it, but I feel like it kind of gets gummed up a little bit over time. Okay. Uh, you're doing a lot. So. Scuzzy is the scientific term, right? Yes. Okay, I'm very good. Definitely approved. Somebody's going <laughs> to give me bad comments for that. Um, so however you want to do it, um, I just put these up here to showcase, you know, that, um, you know, it's got these nice handles so you can set it up some way to actually filter through a fair bit of it. Um, it's really sturdy, which is nice. You can use some range management pin flags for doing some monitoring to help hold it onto your chairs for your visual you know, purposes. But uh, 
Yeah. Does, does it filter relatively quickly or is it a, yeah. kind of a slow yep. process? Yep. No, it goes okay. through really quick. So um, it's a pretty fast process. Because, you know, if you think about it, really, when we're at this spot um, with the raw sap, it's really watery, right? We have very yeah. little sugar that's in there. So um, it's really like just dumping water in there. Okay, um, so the process for actually getting this stuff done. Um, so this is probably where you need to be the most precise. Um, and I think, you know, it's one of those where maybe you just have to go at it over time and kind of learn by doing. Uh, but the big things you've got to think about here is what's your specific elevation. Um, and you have to try and boil this, the sap and to turn it into syrup when it's about seven and a half degrees above the boiling point. So um, I like to use um, a digital thermometer. You can use other types of thermometers, a candy thermometer, whatever you'd like to do. Um, but this is one of those of where we're gonna spend forever boiling, boiling, boiling. And then when we get to this part, things happen quick. So I might be spending hours um, outside while things are boiling. And then once I actually get to this finer part, um, this is when I actually have to make sure I'm taking my time to make sure things are really consistent. So we're going to want things to end up at about 66% sugar. That number varies a little bit. Um, you know, this fluctuates. Some people like it a little bit higher, uh, but this is a general rule of thumb where we're going to, okay? Um, so I know this number is not always consistent throughout all the states. It might be different, um, but that's where we're at. Um, so Abby, as we talked about earlier, we use this example for two reasons. One, we can use this hydrometer. Um, you can also use other types of things, um, but basically um, if you can see me while I'm talking, um, it's this really nice um, hydrometer that actually falls into our container. And then on there, we're actually going to have some numbers that's going to give us um, an approximation of how much sugar is in there. So we drop this in and we can see that we have about 2% sugar. Uh, depending on the type of tree, the time of year, it may vary. Um, most of what I have found for our Manitoba maples here in Wyoming, we're gonna be sitting right about that 2%. Um, I think I've seen two and a half, but uh, you know, you may get a higher percent with like a sugar maple or other types of trees. But for most of what I've noticed is you're gonna be close to that 2%. So um, the other aspect uh, Abby and I wanted to talk about was, see how that doesn't look very clear? So that's Ooh. not really because of the container, that's because we didn't get that boiled fast enough. It's so a little bit scuzzy. If you start seeing that scuzziness, it looks a little cloudy. Um, it almost, the consistency is not the same as what you would think of with water. Um, the viscosity changes. Um, when I'm to that point, I know that you know, we can boil it, but there's probably going to be a not so nice taste associated with it. So, um, so yeah, so keep in mind that um, where you're at, um, is going to dictate what your boiling point is, right? So obviously, um, you know, if you're in Denver, um, which is, you know, probably similar, similar to a lot of places in Wyoming as far as elevation, um, it's going to be a different boiling point than when you're at Death Valley, right? Okay. Um, if I'm here in Laramie, that actually changes as well, right? So Keep that in mind as to where um, that boiling point is going to be. We'll show some examples here. Uh, so for example, this is in Sundance, Wyoming. Um, we probably would want this bottom temperature to be a little bit higher, but I like to set it lower so I can know when I'm getting close and don't burn anything, right? If I'm doing multiple things, I've got stuff going outside, I'm finishing inside. Uh, but I can see here that I'm about 204 degrees for my boiling temperature, okay? Um, as when I go to Laramie, which would actually be lower than 200, uh, but this is just an example of where I've got it set at 206 to make sure that I've got that, that temp of when it's finished. So um, that's a very fuzzy picture, but uh, you can kind of get the idea that that's going to change depending on where you're at. So the bottom line is 
get everything boiling, figure out what your boiling point is, and then you can add your seven and a half degrees from that. Brian, we have a question from Angela concerning where to boil. Do you have to do it outside or can you do it inside on your stovetop? Um, so I like to do all of the, the majority of it outside. Um, when I do the actual finishing, that's going to be inside on the stovetop. So it does so, generate a lot of humidity, right? And you really don't want all that in your house. Yeah. <laughs> if you can yes. avoid it. But, yeah. but the finish process is... It takes less time and there's less humidity being given off and right and you know we did this one time uh we did a hands-on workshop um uh, outside of newcastle and somebody that was there said the same question and i'm like i would do it outside and you know we were talking she's like yeah i've heard of people like having the paint peel when they did <laughs> it all inside and i'm like yeah and so you know i talked i ended up catching up with her a couple of years after and she said yeah i think i ended up doing too much inside and it it, it did get really humid so um so i like to finish on the inside but you can do it all outside you don't have to do any of it inside um the thing you need to think about is right i'm boiling here and you can see the snow outside right so yeah, we're thinking about spring, but we're still trying to hit this when there's snow on the ground and it's frozen. So, you know, just be tough, I guess, and you can finish it all outside. You can do it in a garage, you know, as well, or somewhere like that, an outbuilding. Um, you just need to make sure with that final stage that you have a heat source that is really consistent. Um, you know, here I'm doing some obvious, what is this, on a grill or something. Um, but um, the main thing is you want to make sure it's fairly consistent. Uh, let's see. This is probably not going to be super consistent, right? Um, this is the Wyoming setup, right? I just had to throw it in compared to some super nice evaporator, right? And something like that. So for the finishing stages, I'm probably not going to want to finish here. But if you have a really nice camp stove or something that has a really consistent flame, um, out of the wind, um, that's really important. Um, so as you're boiling, um, some things I wanted to talk about is you see how there's, what did we say earlier, SCSI? Or, SCSI. SCSI, yeah. I think that's the word you used. There's some SCSI scum on the top of this, right? Um, and so generally, I like to pull this off. Um, lots of times, it's just kind of impurities for the most part. Um, so you can actually pull that off um and just dump it out so i use like a, a spoon and just kind of skim it off the top and get rid of it that way uh there are foaming anti-foaming agents but um as you get closer you can tend to get a lot more of it so um here you can see that it's not clear right so we're actually starting to boil that down starting to get a little bit of color uh when we start getting to this point this is when i really want to make sure that i have a good consistent heat source i'm really watching this because things will happen really quick um i've definitely have taken stuff over that seven and a half because i just like oh it'll get there you know and kind of twiddled my thumb and then it just is done like that so abby's probably way better at baking and cooking and having these, you know, abilities to watch things better than I am and not get impatient and get distracted. Um, but for me, it's like, okay, I need to focus now to make sure that this stuff does not get too burnt. Um, so we talked about that. For me, for what I do for a lot of my stuff, I'll just get these big burners like this, um, hook up a propane bottle and let her get going. Um, figure out what my boiling point is. Um, and it's just going to take a while. So we're going to talk about how much is produced and what you need for, for getting stuff um, for a finished product. Um, so as I'm doing this, um, I'm obviously getting things to a pretty big rolling boil. I've got a fair bit of foam that's starting to develop there. Um, a stove top where you can really control that setting for how much heat is really nice. Um, you can put it in containers. Um, again, we should not have myself talking about food safety and preservation because that's just not my forte and we don't want to go there, but I put it in containers, um, and then I can actually just freeze it. So, um, so Brian, so that when, works. You, 
I'm sorry to interrupt. When you, uh, I see that you have dates written on these. Are these the dates that they were processed, yes. or the dates that they were taken from the tap? Um, some of these were. Oh, for this project, these are when they were from the tap, I believe. Okay. Yep. So that was to actually get consistency of where what batches were done when. So that was part okay. of the project. But normally, I would just do when it's processed and write the name. On it. And those are those are not canned. They're just closed. And those are closed. Keep them in the freezer. Closed containers. Yes. And Vicky Heyman's on right now. Okay. She's probably going to rip her hair out, thinking, "What is this guy doing talking about the preservation <laughs> and food safety?" <laughs> So no, talk to Vicki Heyman with UW Extension about how to actually take care of things properly for food safety, so. Brian's only responsible for poisoning himself. Yes, yes, that's where we're keeping. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, John had some questions earlier about how much we can expect. Um, sorry we had to wait this long for the punchline. Um, so here's from two different sites. Um, we didn't collect a ton of data when we did stuff with the high school. It was just kind of one of those we want to take them through the process um, of how everything worked. Um, so you can look at Beulah. We didn't do a ton of trees, um, but some of these older trees, you know, I did 10 trees and I did some younger ones. I kind of did a variation as far as age and size and not to get deep into the numbers, but basically I had some nice big ones that were right next to the, the running water. I thought, okay, these are going to be the ones that give me all the, all the sap. And they really didn't do much. Um, I actually ended up getting more of it from some of the younger trees, but then it was kind of odd because there were some bigger diameter trees that actually did well, but just size really didn't, size was not a factor. Um, you know, it was one of those of like, it probably just came back to tree health. Had I been able to really go back to what trees are doing well, that probably would have led to it. But um, you know, I had some that um, really just didn't do much. Um, and I think it's really telling here, especially with, we go down to the savory site. You know, I had one tree that did over 40 liters. So liters is pretty comparable to quarts. Um, so four quarts and a gallon. So actually quite a few gallons that we got out of a single tree. Then other trees, we hardly got anything at all. Um, and so trying to really figure that out, um, has been really important for um, how do we make this work commercially, right? Like if we wanted to make this a potential viable, you know, product here in Wyoming, how do we figure this consistency out? So hopefully this project that Abby and I are working on will hopefully answer that a little bit more. We can compare that to other states. Um, but yeah, um, you know, we did a lot of a lot of SAP and not a ton of finished product, right? Um, so I think that's important to note. Uh, we did get different grades and we'll talk about more of that in just a second. Uh, but I think the big thing to take home, the big take home message is you may tap a tree that looks really great, looks to be in great health, and it may do quite a bit of raw sap and it may not. So I think keeping that in mind is, is really important. So Brian, for a healthy, for a healthy uh, set of trees, what would be the spacing? If somebody wanted to think about this commercially, what would be the spacing? How many trees can you get into an acre? Do you know? Uh, I don't know. The tough part is that as Abby's picture pointed out in the beginning, we don't have like single trees that we tend to see, single trunk trees like we see with sugar maples. Uh, we tend to see a lot of like multi mm -hmm. or multi, you know, main, main stem trees. So but, but if they were in a commercial setting and you were growing them specifically to be straight, uh, there would be some pruning involved, right? There would be a lot of pruning. Um, so unfortunately, Jeff, I don't know that I can answer that exactly just because it's so variable with how we find them in their, their natural sure. setting. So, sure. okay. Um, and if you were to plant, you know, you're really looking at quite a few years down the road, right? We just don't grow super fast compared to a lot Shade of for the time. next generation yes so um so this is kind of a general rule of thumb again you can go out and find different things that are out there i don't want you to think that this is how you should just you know this is the only way but an old standby is a jones rule of 86 okay 
So basically you can take, uh, if you figure 2% sugar, you can divide that by your percent sugar and you figure out that it's about 43 gallons to make one gallon of syrup, okay? If you're two and a half, it's gonna take about 34 and a half gallons to make one gallon of syrup. Um, so the point of this is it takes quite a bit. Um, so I think that's the challenge, right? Is having enough trees per acre or whatever to make this work commercially. Um, about how long would it take to boil down 40 gallons of syrup? Um, to syrup? 40 gallons, I don't know. Okay. A solid right. after a solid afternoon, depending on what all you had. Okay. Um, I think we probably need to get some more information on that. That's where like a commercial evaporator works so much better than Brian Sebade's Wyoming system. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, that's why I work with somebody like Abby, who's a lot smarter and can figure these things out. So um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the main thing uh, to really think about, Jeff, is like, what do you have for, you know equipment for boiling it down. How much propane are you willing to go through? So um, I think with all that stuff I did at the savory site, uh, what did I go through? Mm, what do we have? 257 liters. I think I went through, I don't know, close to 10 gallons of propane. Okay. Maybe it was like eight gallons, something like that by the time it was all said and done. And then whatever I used on the electric stove in the house to finish it, so. Again, that's why maple syrup is so expensive. That's why it's not cheap. Um, so again, here, if you use that 2%, um, here's kind of what you're looking at. Um, here's some sap that probably needed to be filtered a little bit more and taken a little bit closer to that seven and a half degrees. So I put this up as one of those of it looks good, but this one was a little too watery. So there's a real fine line between that and, and the real finished product. So would um, that be consumable, but not sellable? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. So it's the one you give to your friend you don't like. Yeah. Pancake. Right. Yeah. So I have a question. I have Brian. Yes. Oh, go ahead, Micah. Do you want we to might, ask? We might be getting. Sure. Yeah. We might be getting into this. I think maybe we are, but um, we've got a question from online. Gwen is wondering, and I'm wondering, what does it taste like or does the flavor change from year to year versus like what you would buy at the grocery store? Yeah. So let's, let's talk about that right now. So um, essentially you're going to end up with different grades depending on when you collect that, that sap. Okay. So here is some information on grading. Um, here are three different grades that we collected from the savory site when we collected sap. So we obviously have one that's darker here on the left, a medium grade in the middle, and a lighter one on the right. Um, so the standard way that people describe it, and I have tried box elder right next to sugar maple syrup, is that it has a little bit more of a nuttier flavor, a little bit more of a complex flavor perhaps. Um, I think it does have a little bit of a different taste. Um, but I don't know that it's ever been anything where I'm like, I wouldn't want to eat this, right? Um, you know, as a human that loves sugar, like I'm not gonna turn that stuff down. So um, so yeah, there is a little bit of that that can happen as far as a different taste. The main thing, and again, going back to that, you know, making sure you boil stuff right away is if you don't boil it right away, you're definitely going to get an off taste. So for me, it's like, really do not want that outside of two days. Um, if I'm going to use it, I want to boil it. So Fresh is best. Yep. Um, so there used to be different grades and they've now trade changed the grading system. So I use this from some maple company. Um, I thought they had a pretty nice um, visual to talk about it. Um, and so, you know, I've talked to people before and they say, well, I only, you know, I only do like grade B or commercial grade for syrup that I buy because, you know, that's been, that's been processed less and it hasn't been watered down. And I've had to explain, well, no, it's all the same process, right? Like it's just about the amount of carbohydrates, maybe some tannins, different things like that, that are in there. Um, so if we went and did this process in the fall, right? When things are coming back down the tree through the phloem, 
Is it clear liquid? No, because it has tons of carbohydrates and other things that are in there and it's not good for making syrup at all, right? So we're doing this in the spring when it's nice and clear. Um, but as that goes later on in the season, the general rule of thumb is later in the season, we tend to see um, that color change a little bit. We tend to see a few more carbohydrates and things that that tree is pulling from its root system, going up the tree trunk that we end up getting in there that ends up making that taste a little bit different and the color changes. So, um, so if you like something that is a little bit stronger of taste, go with the grade A, very dark. Um, if you like something that's not quite as much, go with this, you know, grade A golden. Um, depending on what you're eating, um, you may just be going for this. If you're wanting to use this somehow in some sort of cooking or baking application, some people like the, the grade A very dark. So um, generally what you're going to find um, at the store is somewhere in here. So Brian, um, did they ever uh, blend the different grades or is there a price differential between the grades? Yeah, we're getting into shaky territory for me on, on this. Um, <laughs> I'm sure that there is to some extent, uh, some of that that does happen where things do get blended. Um, you know, depending on where you're buying it from, though, uh, you know, people aren't doing that. So, um, but, uh, you know, I'm sure I don't know as far as price goes. Um, I haven't looked into a ton as far as price goes between grade A golden and grade A very dark. Um, you know, the way we operate, I'm sure there probably is, right? You know, you're going sure. to add a price difference just to make somebody think, oh, it's different, right? So I've got to pay more for it. So, um, but again, I'm on shaky ground there. So, um, sorry for the tough questions. No, you're good. You're good. You got to keep me thinking here. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you have any questions about how the grades work, um, again, this is not my forte, but um, there is a whole document from the USDA about how this all works. Um, far as what the process is for collecting, processing it, you know, shipping it, uh, marketing it, all those sorts of things, um, you can find it here. Um, so yeah, Jeff, that's kind of what we had. Um, Jenny, I think we'll be sending out some links. We do have a Barnyards and Backyards article related to what all we've been talking about. Um, we do have one more question. Okay. Uh, I believe it's from Gwen. And uh, how long can you store the finished frozen syrup? Do you want my answer or the food safety answer, Gwen? Because if you have my answer, I'm going to be like, oh, that stuff's good for a couple of years. <laughs> um, we have a canning and processing guide. I don't know if it's in there for sure or not. Um, but so I, I guess. The probably not the correct answer is as long as it's not scuzzy when you take it out of the freezer, it's okay. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm still alive after picking it out of the freezer after a couple of years, but uh, yeah. Like I said earlier, Brian, you're the only one responsible for your own poisoning. So, yes, it's... exactly. <laughs> All right. Oh, there uh, might be a couple more. Nope, that's good. Um, okay. And Abby, I've I've been talking too long, Abby, but uh, I don't I don't know if you had anything else to add. I just get going on my rants. Um, but yeah, you know, I think of this as um, you know, I went and did a uh, you know met with a um, landowner when I lived in Sundance, and uh, we talked with them um, a little bit about it, and he was really thinking about you know the commercial side of it, and he just kind of we got through everything. I showed him the process his trees were really spread out for where he was at. They were not very close together. Um, and he ended up just saying, you know, this is something we'll probably do, but it's just going to be one of those novelty things. Um, it's not an added business that we're going to try and do just based on where everything was at. So, sure. um, you know, for me, where I got started with all this, Jeff, was I had somebody come into my office and say, I've heard you can do this. Do you know if we can? And, uh, you know, as Abby and I and you and Micah work for extension, you know, lots of times we have people come into our office with questions. We do shows like this. We do bulletins or publications. And 
I guess this is one of those projects where somebody was curious about it. So we got going on it. Um, and here we are today, 10 years later. So, yeah. um, um, and, and so part of your, your grant, uh, you are also asking our participants if they'd be willing to do a survey, right? An additional survey other than our own program, uh, just to find out a little bit more about the trees, the grant process. What what are the questions like in your additional so survey? They'll be a little bit similar. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to get um, evaporators and things for our project because they're just not in stock, just the way the world works. Um, so yeah, we may be sending out um, another survey, which will be another QR code. It's going to be fairly similar to what's being sent out today, but just again, kind of seeing if, you know, what we're talking about helps answer the questions you might have about the process and how things happen. Um, so it'll be kind of a pre and a post survey. So um, we'll send that out. But uh, the main thing is, I think, to uh, capture the, the um, one that Jenny's going to send out today um, after this is all done to uh, let us know what other questions you may have that are out there. Um, again, we're kind of in an area where it's tough to see this work exactly like it might for other parts of the United States for, for making this happen. But I think the big take home message from Abby and I is, you know, this is more of a smaller type scale, um, something people can do in their backyard um, or on a smaller property size and, and make things happen. So. And start planting trees now. Start planting trees now. Yeah. So. Hey, thank you both for uh, participating today. Love the topic. Lots of, uh, lots of interesting questions. Lots of things to think about. Micah, will you please take us out for the program today? Absolutely. Yeah, Brian, sometime I'm going to have to try some of this maple syrup that you've got as long as it's uh, scuzz free. Um, so Jenny is pulling up some information for us here. This is the Barnyards and Backyards home website that you are invited to go check out. We've got all kinds of information. Um, and for more um our upcoming shows, I guess if you click on that live tab there that Jenny's showing us, that should pull up our upcoming shows for the remainder of the season. So join us um, Fridays at 10 a.m. until the end of March, and we will have more um, Barnyards and Backyards live content for you. Um, thanks again to our guests today, Brian and Abby. Um, if you have questions like how can I make maple syrup in Wyoming? Um, we ask that you find your local extension office um, and go bug your local extension educator. So this map is showing the locations of those offices all across the state. Um, hopefully there's, there's one in every county and there should be one close to you. And um, we do have, I guess this was mentioned briefly already, but we do have a survey that will be um, sent out following this event immediately. Um, and so we invite you to, to participate in that and give us some feedback so that we can improve these shows for you in the future. And I think that's what we have. Anything else, Jeff? I think you did a great job, Micah. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, for being here. And uh, we'll see you next week.